This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. And welcome to the X-Zone, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and for the next four hours, I'm your host and your guide as together we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the X-Zone. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And the X-Zone comes to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern. And then the show is repeated in its entirety from 2 uh, a.m. until 6 a.m. on the Talkstar Radio Network and the X-Zone Broadcast Network and our growing family of broadcast affiliates right across Canada, the United States, Central America, the Caribbean, South America, the Pacific Rim, Asia, India, Africa, and Europe. If you'd like to give us a call, toll-free worldwide, 1-800-610-7035. That's 1-800-610-7035. Toll-free worldwide. My, my email address, exxon at exxonradiotv.com. On MSN Messenger, exxonradiotv at hotmail.com. And our website, www exxonradiotv.com My first guest tonight is Evan Mandery. We're going to be talking about his book, First Contact, an appropriate book for the show, don't you agree? Well, we're going to be taking a satirical joyride in the tradition of uh, Kurt Vonnegut and Douglas Adams. First Contact introduces us to the hyper-intelligent Rigelians who admire Woody Allen movies and uh, Bunt Cake. Hmm. And urge the people of Earth to meet their ways to avoid destruction of their planet. But the President of the United States, a God-fearing, science-doubting fitness fanatic, is skeptical of the evidence presented to him and sets in motion a chain of events that will change the lives of his young attaché, who is an alien... Uh, I'm sorry, his young attaché, an alien scam artist, several raccoons, and a scientist who has predicted the end of the universe. Uh, unfortunately, the parrot sketch is excluded. Joining me now is the author of First Contact, Evan Mandry. Evan, Evan, welcome to the X-Zone. Hi, Rob. Hello. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm a, uh, well, I used to be a lawyer. I'm a law professor now, mm-hmm. and um, I, uh, I started to write uh, about 10 years ago. I, I worked on a political, political campaign, the New York City mayoral campaign, and I wrote a uh, uh, ostensibly a funny book about it, and uh, I decided I wanted to be a writer, and I started to teach full time. Mm-hmm. And this is my second novel and my fourth book. Tell me why first contact. <laughs> uh, I'm well. I'm a huge sci-fi buff, uh-huh. uh, so um, it's always in my psyche. Uh, and I guess the starting point for the book was a confluence, maybe, of um, <laughs> thinking about George Bush and. <laughs> <laughs> what what type of situation he could have been confronted with where the stakes would have been even higher and how he might have screwed it up even more. You mean he didn't do a good enough job on 9-11, yeah, I, huh? Exactly right. <laughs> right. I wanted, <laughs> wanted to give him more, more capacity to uh, correct things. Tell me, from a lawyer to law professor to writing about aliens and first contact, that's quite a stretch. Uh, yeah, I've always had like this yin and yang. I, I actually uh-huh. I did stand-up comedy for a long time, too. I... It's funny, my my mom is an actress, and my dad was a, a high school teacher and a high school principal, and I always had this, like, you know, creative end pulling at me and <laughs> this very normal, serious corporate type, uh, corporate inclination. But I'll, I'll tell you, I, I'm lucky in a way because, uh, I mean, I'm very fortunate that I've been trying to, been writing for 10 years now, and it's very, very hard to write fiction and make money, and uh, I don't know what I would do if I were... If I were dependent on my uh, on my writing income, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm as lucky as anyone could get with it, but no one can make a living out of it unless you're Stephen King. Evan, stand by. You and I have to take a two-minute commercial break. Evan Mandery is our special guest, Exo Nation. We're going to be talking about his book, First Contact, when we return to this edition of the Exxon for Tuesday, March the 23rd in the year 2010. 
For more information on Evan, visit his website, www.evanmandary.com. The Exxon, a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard, will return on the other side of this commercial break as we continue from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Talk Star Radio Network and the Exxon Broadcast Network. Don't go away. This is Kevin Randall. For nearly 30 years, I have been investigating the case of the Roswell UFO. I have interviewed hundreds of people and stood on the crash site. Now in Roswell in the 21st century, I have reviewed dozens of hours of audio and videotaped interviews, examined hundreds of files that relate to the crash, and have returned to Roswell in an attempt to put all that information into the proper perspective. For the first time in Roswell in the 21st century, I have made a dispassionate reevaluation of all that material and provide a new look at what happened. This is a book that clears away all the clutter that has hidden the truth for so long, strips away the various lies that surround the case, exposes the Air Force attempts at cover-up, and found a core of solid information that tells us all where the case stands today. Roswell in the 21st Century will be available in just a few weeks. For more information, please visit my website at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention, specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration, and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at www.drgibbswilliams.com. Shamanism is recognized as a method to access the quantum level. Mastery of shamanic skills puts spiritual information and healing power into your hands. Path Home Shamanic Art School, a bonded Colorado certified occupational school, has met rigorous state standards ensuring its director and instructors have the qualifications to teach the shamanic arts. Path Home offers a certification program in blocks of study. Block 1, a five-day intensive, will be held in the beautiful mountain town of Coldale, Colorado, October 13th through 18th. Registration deadline is September 12th. Experience journey trance, power animals, helping spirits, sacred space, and life purpose. Come discover your power. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, in the magical world of shamanism. Call 303-775-3431 or visit findyourpathhome.com. With each new extreme weather event or terrorist act, it becomes increasingly obvious that we live in uncertain and challenging times. We all buy car insurance. Why not collapse and catastrophe insurance? Matthew Stein, an MIT-trained engineer and green builder, has written two outstanding books to help people prepare, plan for, and deal with everything from minor situations lasting a few days to full-on collapse. Matt's first book, When Technology Fails, is a manual for self-reliance, sustainable living, and surviving the long emergency. This massive book covers the gamut from first aid and emergency preparedness to alternative healing, renewable energy, primitive living skills, and 18th century technologies that could be critical to your comfort and survival in a long-lasting crisis. Matt's second book, When Disaster Strikes, is a comprehensive emergency preparedness handbook and survival guide. When Disaster Strikes is an essential item for every family's go-bag. Both books are available at all usual sources. There's a wealth of totally free information posted at whentechfails.com and author signed copies may be purchased at mattstein.com. That's www.wentechfails.com and www.mattstein.com. 
Well, that's what Evan and I are going to do in the next hour. We're going to give people something to talk about. Evan Mandry is our special guest. He's the author of First Contact, and his website is www.evanmandry.com. All right, Evan, uh, tell us a little bit about your book and and uh, and about the principles in it. And first of all, where did these aliens did they did they make a mass landing or how did this no, all happen? Uh, in my book, they're very nice aliens. Um, oh. The uh, they, 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 the premise is that they've come to Earth because um, they're, they've made a, a, a statistical calculation that Earth is, um, is more likely than not to destroy itself, and they're, they're trying to be helpful. And um, so as you read in the description of the book, the, by the way, it's funny, so I, I, I talk about it in the serious terms, but everything in the book is kind of absurd and satirical. But um, the president is, uh, is very skeptical of them, um, for a few reasons, they come. Uh, they, they they're big fans of Woody Allen, and they recreate a, a scene from Bananas. I don't know if you remember yes. the movie where yes, I people do. come they come off they come off uh, dressed as uh, dressed as uh, rabbis, and mm-hmm. and uh, Woody Allen's like I said, call the UN, not the UJA. <laughs> uh, but the president doesn't like it. He doesn't get it, and so he he reaches a conclusion. He he, he doubts them, and uh, in any case, he's a doubter of scientific evidence. And so he reaches the conclusion that they're evil, and that ends up uh, putting the United States or the planet on uh, on a bad path with them. And um, anyway, it's a lot about a lot of the the, the, the discussion in the book is about different worldviews. About you know, um, I think based on our brief exchange, that you're probably somebody who goes on works on the basis of empirical evidence and data. Yes, and the president's very skeptical of it, as as the previous president of the United States was. I mean, it's it says something that he sent the the country to war, you know, on the basis of praying on something. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of people would call that stupidity, but I wouldn't. Yeah, I, you know, not I, in public. I try, anyway. uh, I try to bridge. I, I think my book has a few serious points, and mm-hmm. one of them is to try to find a way to understand that worldview without calling it. Stupid, and it's not my worldview. I mean, I am I am definitely uh, an empiricist, but yeah. the fact is, at least if you live in, in uh, if you live down here, uh, there are more people who think like he does than think like we do, and that's a lot of people. T- tell me, as a person, as an occupant of planet Earth, what do you think of the possibility that aliens might be zipping in our skies and little UFOs, even though nobody for the last 63 years since the alleged crash at Roswell, New Mexico, has been able to prove their existence? Uh, well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, say what I, I'll say what I want to say spiritually <laughs> as a human being, and then my take on it. Oh, the okay. Certainly, and I respect uh, both views. How, how can it not be true? I mean, it can't, it can't possibly be the case that... Uh, we're the only inhabitants, mm. the only living inhabitants of the universe. So I, I take it as a given that there is other intelligent life in the universe, and given its enormity, certainly other more intelligent life in the universe than ours. And then the question is how long it takes them to find us and whether we would be of interest to anybody. So really it's just, it's just a question of whether we're at the right moment in time or not, right? Obviously it's, it's just a question of when it will happen. Uh, I don't know. I'm interested. I'll, I, I'd pro- you're you're more expert than I am. I, I'll I'll listen to your take on uh, mm. on Roswell. Uh, I I I'm on the side of it was um, it was a real crash. I, I I attached a lot of weight to the contemporaneous newspaper accounts. Well, uh, but I will say on the other hand, I'm, I think um, conspiracies are hard to manage, and it's yeah. very hard to keep lots of people quiet. You see, my my theory is is that the U the 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 alleged conspiracy that the UFO community loves to say that the government of the world or the different governments of the world are try you know are are perpetrating is is wrong. That the real people behind the UFO conspiracy is the UFO community itself, because as long as they maintain the conspiracy is in play, they do not have to produce any evidence for their claims. Right. Yeah, I don't think I, I. I love I love conspiracy theories mm-hmm. um, as as stories, sure. <laughs> and and then I, I have a skepticism. Of, of, I, I just think you know you think about how hard it is to keep your uh, you know everybody in your family quiet about something, let alone all of the people that would have to be involved to manage a cover up exactly. on the side of say what people think with respect to September 11th. 
Now that doesn't mean that that also doesn't mean that the truth isn't different than what the conventional wisdom is. And what I'm always very interested in, particularly when you're talking about very recent history, which is much more like journalism than history, which is how quickly the operative hypothesis is formed. And you know, if you look at September 11th, which was you know, which has been the fodder for lots of uh, conspiracy discussions. Mm -hmm. History was written, particularly in the, you know, in the, in the age we live in, where information is so readily available. The operative narrative was written within six hours, and it can't possibly be, it can't be possible to conclusively know something like that in so short a time period. Well, I, I use another example. If the President of the United States cannot have a presidential affair between the Oval Office and the Presidential John without the world finding out in the most secure building in the entire world. How in the name of heaven are you going to hide a couple of crashed UFOs and a couple of aliens? It, it makes no sense to me. Yeah, I agree. I, uh, I, I think cover-ups are very, very hard to manage, and mm -hmm. that's a great example of it. It's, um, it's, uh, it's hard, but I, I still um, I, I don't think that precludes the possibility that the truth is different than the truth is something other than the conventional wisdom. Uh, you know, I, I agree with that. But once again, taking into account today's technology where everyone has a cell phone, and I would say the vast majority of cell phones now have digital cameras and uh, video cameras in them, and still nobody has come up with that all-conclusive photograph of a UFO. And as Bill Clinton said to Monica, well, we blew it. <laughs> You know, there's a fascinating. Um, you probably, so you're you're a skeptic. I'm interested in that. That's uh, you're uh, um, you're a collector of the evidence and, uh, and and a skeptic or a realist about it. Yeah, you ha you have to be. Uh, well, I think so. <laughs> I, I, nobody has to be. I, I think oh. that's the that, that's the reasonable position to take. But there are plenty of uh, not everybody. You see, Evan, Evan, I look at myself as a journalist, a broadcast journalist. I don't look at myself as as a woo woo talk show host. Good. Uh, I think that's that's the that's the that's the place to begin a constructive discussion. Exactly. You know, there's a fascinating thing. Did you read? Um, do you recall in the Vince Foster um, autobiography what he said about his discussions with Clinton? That no. Clinton asked him when he uh, that Clinton asked him when uh, he took office. He asked Foster to find out the answers to two questions, and it was. One was the Kennedy assassination, and the other was Roswell, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And this very brief mention of it in the book, and Foster says he wasn't able to, he wasn't able to answer either of the questions conclusively, which in some ways is easier to believe with respect to Kennedy, because some of that information is embargoed. Oh, I'll anyway. tell you something. When you talk to people about the Kennedy assassination, and, and you know, as a young man growing up, I, I think it was in grade four or five when President Kennedy was assassinated. I you know, to me that day will never will never be forgotten from my mind or my heart because I, I, I thought Kennedy was a, a man of well, he was a great guy. He was a great man and he had vision and, you know, unfortunately we lost him. But when it comes to Roswell and you and uh, it, it, once once again I'm I'm gonna drag it over into ufology here for a sec. When you look at all the evidence, or lack thereof, and you've got all these people since, well, Stanton Friedman came out with his first book, and then you had everybody jumping on the bandwagon, and Stanton Friedman, by the way, has never seen a UFO. Um, you, you know, it's, it, it's, it's hard, especially when you look at the facts, as reported by all the different researchers, where you had the, the base intelligence army officer go out to the crash scene, and apparently he collects some debris, evidence. And what does he do instead of going right back to the base and maintaining the chain of evidence, which you as a lawyer and a professor of law, I don't have to explain this, but what does he do? He brings it home, takes it out of the vehicle, brings it to his kids, uh, to his son and his wife, and says, look what I've got. Yeah, it's a very unhelpful fact. I recall, I recall yeah. that part of the story, and of course... Each side is going to attach weight to it when, of course, all you're really interested in is what the evidence actually was. You exactly. Just want to see it, that's all. Exactly. Yeah, and and that's, then that's, and then to throw into the into the mix of the the Japanese fugos that were still in the air at that time, and if somebody didn't know the difference of uh, of Japanese writing to Chinese writing to ancient hieroglyphics or or the writings of a little man from Alpha Centauri. 
How could they not, how could they say with any certainty that this was alien? And we know for a fact. They couldn't say with any certainty. Exactly, exactly. So am I a realist? I try to be. Do I think there are things in the sky that people see that they don't identify? Sure, that's why they're called UFOs, unidentified flying objects. Do I think that little green men from different planets or greys have come to this planet? I don't know. I haven't seen any. And over the 20 years doing this show, no one has presented me with any evidence. There's, uh, there's something my book touches on, though. I, as I said, you know, I'm a huge grew up, I, I mean, I watch and read tons of science fiction, uh-huh. and there's something very, um, I think my story and stories like it resonate with people in a way, because obviously, like, you know, you remember from the X-Files, I want to believe, and it's sure. really true. And the question is, what is it in the human psyche that makes people want to believe that? And I think it's a very, it's a very basic existential thing that people want to feel like there's meaning and purpose to things, and I think it, it helps in some way to think that there's you know, more to existence than, than our kind of... But you know lives. what the ironic part about that entire uh, scenario is, Evan? Theology has been trying to give that to humanity since day one. Yeah, so it's, uh, it, it, it's, tapping into, yep. it's tapping into the same basic human needs. All right, stand by, Evan. You and I have to take a commercial break with the news at the bottom of the hour. Evan Mandery is our special guest. He is the author of First Contact, www.evanmandery.com. My name is Rob McConnell. This is the X-Zone. And Evan and I will return on the other side of this news break as we continue from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Talkstar Radio Network and the all-new X-Zone Broadcast Network. Don't go away, X-Zone Nation. We'll be right back. It was a terrifying experience. I thought we was going to go to jail for murder. That day, you know, we were a little behind, so we worked until it was starting to get dark. We loaded up the equipment and hadn't driven very far when we caught glimmers of this glow coming through the trees. I urged Mike to hurry up and get up there. Travis had the door open before we even stopped. As he got closer, I heard the sound. One of the guys said, you feel that? I really panicked then. I told him, get the hell out of here. It didn't come directly to me. It came to a, a deputy sheriff. Three of us volunteered right away to tell him what had happened. But sheriff Gillespie definitely didn't believe it. He says that we better be certain because we can get in a lot of trouble. When we went to search the next day, they split us up, and the whole time the deputies asked me, you know, if you just tell us where the body is, we can all go home and get this over with. We're talking about a hundred people combing through the wooded area. Nothing turns up. All week long, I've been hearing they're gonna set it up to make you guys look guilty. We're a rough looking bunch then. Some of us have been in trouble with the law before. And y'all ain't never gonna come out of that jailhouse. We couldn't get out. I tried to sneak out the back door the day of the polygraph test. I was scared to death. On top of that, you have media. I literally would be on two telephones at the same time. We even got some coops in here now that's coming in and out to see the freak show, as they call it. Everyone descends. I just wasn't going to stand there and listen to it anymore. Granny says, this is Travis. I'm back. I need help. When I did hear that he had been returned, it was almost as unbelievable as the original thing. I just looked at my mom and says, I told you we didn't kill him. Travis Walton reappeared after several days with a bizarre story about a ride in an unidentified flying object. People were desperate to explain it away. Why are you sticking up with Travis for all this time? You know this really didn't happen. What happened to Travis after we took off in that truck, I can't tell you. I hated Travis for a long time after this. My whole world just tore up. But I believe every word Travis said about it. He's never lied to me about nothing. It's a net negative. We lost our jobs in the immediate aftermath. And now you're not able to talk about it with anyone because you know that they're going to laugh at you, they're going to look at you like you're crazy. But if you don't come out and tell your story, somebody else is going to tell it for you. There's a degree of responsibility, but certainly I have to accept the bad. If I can direct what's happened in a way that I can make something good happen in the world, I'm looking for it.
Order your copy of Travis, The True Story of Travis Walton today at www.traviswaltonthemovie.com. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exome Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, High Tech with Corey Kay, and every minute of the 24-7, 365 programming of the Exome Broadcast Network by calling 712-432-9459, courtesy of TalkStream Live. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 712-432-9459 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 712-432-9459 for the best of paranormal, new age, thought-provoking, sci-fi radio programming 24-7, 365. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we'll weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Evan Mandry is our special guest this hour. He is the author of First Contact, and uh, Evan's website is www.evanmandry.com. And uh, Evan, did you ever think uh, as you, as you were? putting yourself through law school and, um, you know, a practicing lawyer, now law professor, former stand-up comedian and author, that you'd be writing about aliens, even though you, you're, you're a sci-fi buff. Did you think it would come down to this? And, and... Uh, I, it's great. It's my best destiny. I, uh, I, 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 I'm living my, my dream. I mean, uh, I, uh, I loved Vonnegut and, uh, I loved, uh, Douglas Adams, uh, yeah. more than anything I read. And, uh, to be even a small part of that uh, universe, is, it's a lot of fun for me. So 
I, I, if I if I didn't believe in it, it would have only been because I didn't think I could achieve it, not because I didn't want it. I'm I'm very happy. T- tell me, why do you think sci-fi is still the number one genre? Uh, well, we were talking about this a little bit before, and I, I think there's something so basic. I mean, if you remember, uh, which I'm sure you do, like all of the the, the positive ways that Star Trek resonated yeah. in the 60s. Mm-hmm. And you know, Gene Roddenberry wrote about this a lot, about why why he thought Star Trek such a cor- struck such a chord with people, and it was a lot about hope and and, uh, and faith and of course science fiction is is generally a very progressive universe where equal, you know I mean I guess it depends on who you're reading but much more aspirational and much more in terms of race and clashes class issues much more progressive I, I think it's a vision of the future that's much better for most people and gives people I mean I think there's a lot to what you said and it also ties into a lot of the same uh, sentiments and basic psychological needs that religion mm-hmm. uh, fulfill, which is to feel like you have a place in things. Yeah. Uh, I'm not re- I'm not religious, <laughs> and yet you know uh, I don't I'm I'm like you. I mean I'm I'm, I'm sober and skeptical about the mm-hmm. the evidence or absence of evidence for uh, for for aliens. But we, I, I'm sure what I wa- I'm sure what I want I want to believe it. You know. You know there are there are so many parallels when it comes to ufology and theology, it, it astounds me that people within the UFO community and people within the religious circles do not see the connection. For example, you've got people descending from the skies like like the like God used to do and the angels and the the you know the good and the bad the grays and and the benevolence uh, uh, aliens and and of course the angels and the demons there are so many parallels i often wonder if we created the entire ufo phenomenon and scenario because even though theology has been around so long it just hasn't kept up with the times and society said we need another way to look at what theology was trying to get get us to understand, except in more modern times. It's very interesting that you say I'm working on a I'm working on a short story right now that's going to be in a volume called The Atheist's Guide to Christmas. So I'm I'll show I'll reveal my cards. I mean I'm not a I'm not a, a religious person. Um, so when I look at the uh, I look at the similarities in the stories the same way that you do. That mm-hmm. I I can't understand how people don't recognize that at a level of abstraction that the Jesus myth is no different than any of the many other religious myths or UFO-related myths, that it's just a desire to attach a lot of weight and power to some creature whose existence you can't confirm. So it makes sense to me. (laughs) But, of course, if you're in one of those groups, you're completely invested in the correctness of it, so it's very hard to take that step back and, you know, and look at it abstractly and say, oh, I'm just situated in a different myth, even though Mm -hmm. it's a myth. Um, a lot to ask people. Sorry, it, it, and and in today's society, it seems that people who do not fit any other uh, I'm going to get my foot shot off for this one, but if they don't fit into any sociological category, or they're not accepted by different peer groups in society, they find themselves in the paranormal because everybody fits in there. Except I, I would agree with that only, and I, you'll probably agree with this modification. It's just that if you are uh, a deeply believing, and, and I apologize if I offend uh, if I offend uh, anyone in your audience, but if you're a deep believing Christian, you're just situated in a different version of paranormal or a different mythology. Oh. And then I guess if you don't fit within one of those boxes, you find yourself you find yourself in another one, and and belief in you know in extraterrestrials and paranormal is just this. But this is actually very. This is very well documented in um, in sociology and psychology mm-hmm. in terms of uh, the sorts of people who are going to be attracted to these uh, to these types of belief systems. And and there's just not one belief system because in the paranormal universe, I can't believe I use those two words in the same sentence. But anyway, mm-hmm. you you've got the Ghostbusters, you've got the Bigfoot hunters, you've got the Lake Monster hunters and believers. You've got the the people who have been abducted by aliens and suffered the the uh, the examinations of anal probes. You've got the people who have been abducted by aliens who have had their fetuses removed. Of the expecting mothers have had the fetuses removed from their bodies allegedly. 
I, I've talked to a couple of people over the years who swear to God. Now, they, they, there you go. They swear to God that they were actually teleported to a UFO that is in orbit around Jupiter that is over 300 miles in diameter. Yeah, I've read some of the teleportation stories, too. I um. I mean, the first thing which is interesting is when you say, like, all these different categories, well, you know, there are Presbyterians and Baptists and Buddhists and Hindus. And there you go. And, uh, you know, there are different boxes, and it's, and it's it'd be very, very interesting to try to study this in a systematic way. But, of course, the predictors of which box you end up falling into, I mean, when it comes to religion, it's largely determined by your family. Mm-hmm. And I imagine when it comes to these boxes, it's also... Similar random, similarly random things like which story you've heard that ends up kind of filtering into your conscience, um, subconscious. Um, but yeah, it's, man, it's very, it's very, very peculiar. Now, those, um, if you've examined, so I'm, I'm just interested in the teleportation stories mm-hmm. for a second. What do those people say? First of all, had they ever heard those stories beforehand? Definitely. Uh, they have. Def- so. Definitely, they've all heard these of these stories before. And, uh, you know, could, they, you know, maybe they're out of body experiences and, uh, and they just haven't, uh, it may be a dream. And, but once again, they, they come back with these stories without any trace evidence. Now, how can you get uh, an anal that, probe? Have you ever not? met anybody who had any evidence? Of no, anything? sir. I mean, what are they, they must, they must claim that they have evidence, right? I mean, they don't just say, I have nothing, so they they, they would cite their memory as evidence, but do any of them ever offer any physical evidence? Well, some may have little marks on their body that they can't remember getting, but, it, you know, who knows? I, there's many a times I'll get home at night and my wife will say, where'd you get that bruise? I don't know. You know, right, and, and I know for a fact I haven't been abducted by aliens, and if I did, I wish they'd let me know, because I'd certainly like to have a conversation with them. You know, I, I say, well, what did it? What did the surroundings feel like? What was the temperature? Were there any smells that you could associate it with? You did you try to touch it? Did you try to steal something and bring it back? Well, well, let me ask you this. So sure. now that I I feel I've gotten to know you a little better. Sure. So you've obviously been exposed to heaps and heaps of people and information that I would find interesting, if not persuasive, certainly interesting. Definitely. Was there ever somebody that you? encountered uh, in person or, you know, in one of these sorts of interviews mm-hmm. where you had a moment and said to yourself, hmm, I think there might be something there. Travis Walton. Who's, who's Travis Walton? Do you remember the story Fire in the Sky? Sure. Uh, okay, His, the, the, the lead character is Travis Walton. There is something in that story when you've got all the, the members of this uh, forest, uh, forest cutters or uh, these loggers who passed a lie detector test. Travis Walton could not be found for a number of days. He shows up in Herber, Arizona on, I believe it was November the 11th, naked, calls up his, uh, calls somebody up. They come and get him. And ironically, on November the 11th, there were weird, strange radar trackings from Arizona up to the Great Lakes uh, where Air Force radar had detected UFO activity unknowns, sent up fighters from Sethridge Air Force Base near Detroit as this UFO, or whatever it was, was targeted over Lake Superior in the approximate place where the Edmund Fitzgerald sank under suspicious circumstances. Now, when it comes to the Edmund Fitzgerald, uh, no bodies have ever been recovered, and in none of the life rafts. You know, so, so is this coincidence? If it is, it's one hell of a coincidence. And so there, to you, what separated that story from the others was that you felt that there was like a confluence of, of circumstantial evidence. Exactly. Like, yeah, that's interesting. Exactly. Um, I have to go back and reread that, uh, read that story. Uh, I mean, I, I'm certainly, I, I, I'll say this, I'm sure if you're telling me that, it's gonna be, I'm going to find it compelling reading. There's no question about that. So, um, you know, but when it comes to people who have had uh, regression hypnosis, I give that no credibility whatsoever. Yeah. Do you remember uh, Carl Sagan wrote in? Um, it's not in. It's not in Cosmos. It's, it's in another book at the end of the book, and he was talking about. He said he thought there were three, and I think he characterized them as paranormal phenomena that he thought were worth investigating. And one of them was past was actually past life regression, and it's. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting. I I, I don't I don't say mm-hmm. say this at all as a believer. I uh, 
I would say I'm only a believer in his credibility and right. as, as and as that as it being worth uh, investigating. Well, l- let me let me put it to you this way: over the years, I've talked to many people. You know, like I do the show five nights a week. There's four guests a, na- a night. That's uh, 20 guests a week, 80 guests a month, and I've been doing it for 20 years. Quite a few guests. It's a lot of guests. And when you talk to those, when you do shows on past life regression, and you get five or six who claim to have been Cleopatra. Yeah. Now, how can you have five or six different people being the same person? Well, I mean, this one is, the interesting thing about this is this one is testable. I mean, if mm-hmm. you have, um, you know, if you ask a three-year-old certain questions and the three-year-old's able to give you information that they couldn't possibly be in a position to know. Now, mm-hmm. I can't say to you that there's ever been an example of, of this, but whereas, you know, it's at least susceptible to proof, whereas teleportation to Jupiter, unless you've got a, unless you've got a fast-moving spaceship that I don't know about, Makes you're not going to be able yeah. to verify it, but... Yeah, if a three-year-old could tell you a detail of the Battle of the Bulge that he or she couldn't possibly know, well, that would be pretty convincing evidence. I Anybody agree. ever give you anything like that? No. Okay. I agree with you. That would be interesting. You see, I, too, want to be a believer. I really do, but I want, you know, I, in, do you remember that Wendy's commercial with the old lady saying, where's the beef? Of course. That's what I want. Uh, Clara, Clara Peller was her name. We ran a contest where we offered $1 million, and this is going back uh, to, I guess it was 1997, 1998, when a million dollars was really worth a million dollars, to anyone who could bring forth or send to us proof of alien existence or proof of a UFO. Man, FedEx would bring us box after box after box of stuff. We had people who would take motherboards and uh, solder stuff together. We had flying tin (laughs) cans. You name it. No proof. No proof. So, am I a skeptic? I'm a realist. Well, you know, there's an epistemological question, too, which is, and I'll say this as a lawyer, proof is... Proof is a subjective term. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's it's a question of what the quantum of proof that you're going to require is, and... um, there are some questions that are just not easily provable. So you, you're operating in a domain where, you know, conclusive proof is just going to be hard to obtain. And, and that doesn't make anybody uh, right or wrong. I mean, I, I, I'm entirely sympathetic to your views. I'm just saying, um, you know, I mean, if you believe in God and I say to you, prove it to me, well, yeah. you're not going to be able to prove it to me. But, of course, if I say to you, God doesn't exist and you say prove it to me, I'm probably not going to be able to prove it to you either. There you go. Uh, so it's just a question of where you're going to set the default where the uh, you know where the presumption of where the presumption of innocence where the presumption is going to be counselor please stand by you and I have to take yeah, a commercial yeah, yeah. break <laughs> <laughs> Evan Mandry is our very special guest Evan we're going to have to have you back on in the future it's great chatting with you Evan's website is www.evanmandry.com he's the author of First Contact we'll be back on the other side of this commercial break as the Exxon continues right here on Talkstar and the Exxon Broadcast Network we want- Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free.
Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exome Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, High Tech with Corey Kay, and every minute of the 24-7, 365 programming of the Exome Broadcast Network by calling 712-432-9459, courtesy of TalkStream Live. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 712-432-9459 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 712-432-9459 for the best of paranormal, new age, thought-provoking, sci-fi radio programming 24-7, 365. Coming soon to the Exxon Broadcast Network is a different perspective with me, Kevin Randall, as your host. We'll be taking a close look at what is happening in the world of UFOs today with side trips into the paranormal. Guests will range from those who are household names to those who have a different perspective on a variety of topics. No topic will be taboo, but there will be tough questions asked as we all search for the truth about UFOs, the paranormal, and those things that excite us. Sometimes we'll agree with a guest and sometimes we won't, but we'll try to keep the program topical. For those of you who would like to read, be sure to visit www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com and remember to listen to the other fine programs on the X-Zone Broadcast Network at www.xzbn.net. This is Kevin Randall. For nearly 30 years, I have been investigating the case of the Roswell UFO. I have interviewed hundreds of people and stood on the crash site. Now in Roswell in the 21st century, I have reviewed dozens of hours of audio and videotaped interviews, examined hundreds of files that relate to the crash, and have returned to Roswell in an attempt to put all that information into the proper perspective. For the first time in Roswell in the 21st century, I have made a dispassionate reevaluation of all that material and provide a new look at what happened. This is a book that clears away all the clutter that has hidden the truth for so long, strips away the various lies that surround the case, exposes the Air Force attempts at cover-up, and found a core of solid information that tells us all where the case stands today. Roswell in the 21st Century will be available in just a few weeks. For more information, please visit my website at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genix provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. 
Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, is available on Amazon and at stores worldwide wherever books are sold. And welcome back, everyone. Evan Mandari is our special guest. He's the author of First Contact. His website is www.evanmandari.com. That's E-V-A-N-M-A-N-D-E-R-Y. That's E. Let me try this one again. E-V-A-N-M-A-N-D-E-R-Y.com. And uh, first of all, Evan, I, I want to thank you so much for joining us. It's been a it's been a great hour. The time has just flown right by. But I have to ask you at this point. What do the several raccoons have to do with your story? Uh, there's lots of, you know, <laughs> our conversation has been so serious, and uh, yeah. I believe a lot of the subtext to my book is serious, but superficially it's all funny, and basically uh, raccoons reappear several times through the book, and when the President of the United States uh, launches this mm-hmm. mission, this attack against the alien planet, uh, it's basically thwarted because... Uh, a raccoon stows away in the compartment of the nuclear, where the, the chamber where the nuclear armaments are contained, and he eats through these uh, the wiring, and uh, it leads to the crew having to release the uh, the nuclear missiles uh, manually in a way, sort of like Doctor Strangelove, uh, you know, the end of Doctor Strangelove. Wow. Where, uh, anyway, it's a joke. It's all a joke. Tell uh, me, if if you were driving on a highway, let's say later on today, and it's about 11 o'clock at night. All the traffic seems to have petered off, and you're the only vehicle on this highway. You're driving along, and in, this, in the distance, you see this, this object in the middle of the road. And as you get closer, you see it to be the classic UFO. You stop your car. A door opens. You get out of your car to investigate, because after all, you're a cool guy. And you think, hey, could be a book in this. The E.T. or the occupant walks over to you. What would be your first words? Oh, gosh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about that for one second, and I'm going to tell you something else, though. You know, I used to think about this question a lot when I was a kid. And I used to love, I don't know if you've ever seen a show called Doctor Who, but I was yeah. a huge Doctor Who fan. And I always used to say, well, if Doctor Who comes, I'm going with him. But we just had a baby, and uh, I'm not going anymore. So, oh, congratulations. Um, <laughs> well, I have to hope the guy speaks English. I probably would extend my hand and... Uh, Shake it and say, hi, nice to meet you. I, I, my inclination, and the aliens in my book are very much like this, would be to treat the alien like I would treat everybody else. I would not presume that they were sinister. And, um, uh, you know, if they're there, I'm going to think that they're probably interested in meeting me. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to worry about it so much. I'm just going to be nice. That's all. All we can do <laughs> is hope they look like Robin Williams and say, Nanu Nanu Shazbut. Well... Yeah, we could do better. I'm, 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 we could do better than the Mork, uh, the Mork and Mindy, uh, <laughs> the Mork and Mindy version. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I maybe this is naive, but I, 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 I don't see any reason to believe that if it ever happens that it's going to be a, a hostile encounter. Yeah, so neither I would, do I. I'd welcome it. Yeah. Evan, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Tell our listeners how they can find out more about you. Uh, first of all, thanks, Rob. Likewise, pleasant. Very, very, very nice talking to you. And, uh, yeah, my website is uh, com, and I have uh, my novels are up there, and uh, I have a, I do a lot of research and writing on the death penalty uh, in my legal career, and uh, they can find that all there, too. Evan, take care of yourself, and once again, congratulations on the new addition to your family. Thanks very much. Exo Nation, Evan Mandry has been our very special guest. He is the author of First Contact. Once again, his website is www evanmandary.com I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break at six and a half minutes past the hour as the Exxon continues live and around the world from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada on the Talkstar Radio Network and on the Exxon Broadcast Network. We'll be back on the other side of the news. Don't go away. <laughs> 